First of all, I need to thank my two, my two presenters who have done a lot more than present me on this stage this evening. Without them, I certainly wouldn't be here tonight. John Thompson joined the Nike Board of Directors in June of 1991. Is that right? Close enough. 21 years. When he first joined, he was one of two coaches, the other being the 1972 Olympic coach and my business partner, Bill Bowerman. Everyone was a little concerned about two such uh, people that had such strong opinions being in one small boardroom together. That was put to ease in the first hour of the first meeting. They got along famously. But one of the things that bonded them was criticism for me. But I can tell you quite seriously, I am all the better for it. And no conversation about who the greatest player of all time was can be held without including the name Michael Jordan. <clears throat> I was going to repeat that he's one, the main reason I'm here tonight, but then I realized that wasn't good enough. His, ma his magic made him a brand and enriched both our lives artistically, poetically, and financially. More than that, he revolutionized an industry and dominated a culture. He is to the sporting goods industry what Nathan Hale, Patrick Henry, Che Guevara, and Mao Zedong were to the world of politics. The sporting industry will never be the same, and his brand today sells more product than when he was at the peak of his game. I asked Ahmad, who in the world, who in the world presented Michael Jordan to this group? And he said what they did was they flooded the Connecticut River, and he walked across the water to the podium. <laughs> I have another escort, one who came 3,000 miles with me on this weekend and through the decades across Death Valley and up Everest. She would not have chosen to walk the last 10 feet tonight, even if she could. She chooses to stay out of the limelight. This week marks our 41st, 44th wedding anniversary. For a present on such a special occasion, I gave her an all-expenses trip to Springfield, Massachusetts. <laughs> it's sort of poetic, considering how many athletic events we've gone to on our, on our wedding anniversary. And I know Charles Barkley is here. I think I have to explain that when we said we climbed Mount Everest, we didn't really do that. That's a metaphor. It's, <laughs> it's, it's like the journey that you and Maureen have been on although it sort of seems to me that she spends most of her time in Death Valley. <laughs> I thought it was funny. <laughs> I enter this group to which so many aspire, the group of Cousy and Charmin, and West, Oscar, Russell, and so many other greats. I entered it as a contributor. There are 1,700 people here tonight, and if you ask each of them what a contributor is, I suspect that you would get 1,700 answers. 700, 1,700 different answers. But there is for sure one common denominator in each of those answers. That's what unifies us all, this game. It brings together young and old, couch potatoes and the greatest athletes. Through this game, you learn values of hard work, teamwork, winning and losing that apply to your post-basketball days more than any biology course or literature course. In my youth, there was no such thing as specialization at an early age. It was football in the fall, basketball in the winter, track in the spring, and baseball in the summer. I was a product of those sports. In the winter months, it may be hard to believe, but I was a gym rat. Wearing floppy socks before Maravich, Converse shoes. Getting a new pair at a cost of $7 before the big game every season. In grade school and high school, it was, it was grade school it was, after dinner, it was over to the gym for two hours until they closed the gym. And with a sweaty shirt, I'd roam, ride home on my Columbia, Fly, Fire, Columbia Flyer bike in the chill of winter, but avoided a cold by the smile on my face. Saturday afternoons, were, Saturday afternoons and mornings were at Sacred Heart until dinner time. 50 pickup games. Winners stayed, losers sat. And then to the high school team. I got bigger, I got up to 130 pounds. 
the Cleveland High School Indians, Portland City League champions, and then to the University of Oregon, where the specialization began. It was track for me, which is a different sport, but it shares a common denominator with basketball, and that's coaches. You know, those men and women whose wisdom shapes you over the years long after the games have ended, who offer those bits of wisdom that are seared in your brains forever, words like, don't give up, don't ever give up. There are over 300 NCAA Division I track and field teams. Only one can win the national championship. Bill Bowerman won four. His job was to train them and get them right mentally. And in that process, he, he said he was not so much a track coach, but a professor of competitive response. And it wasn't enough. He also had an interest in shoes, how to modify them and to enhance their performance that led me to my life's work. Yes, the influence of coaches. Without that coach, I've said many times, if there was no Bill Bowerman, there is no me. Without him, I'm not in the shoe business. There is no Nike, no Brand Jordan, and most certainly no admission to this body on this evening. As the old joke goes, what would I have been? Maybe just a bookkeeper in a brothel. <laughs> but I, I hasten to add that I'm a Price Waterhouse CPA, so I would have kept the counts pr properly. <clears throat> Nike is successful now. Before there, was, before there was success, there was defeat. We were kicked out of two banks. We borrowed money once from a shoebox manufacturer to meet the payroll. On another time, we had to sell $2,500 at a national PE convention in Seattle, Washington on a Friday so we could meet payroll on Monday. In all those cases, the lessons from the fields and the courts, the lessons of competitive response, were the most valuable of all. And through the ups and downs, we had during this time walked hand in hand with the game itself. As Bernard Malamud pointed out, without heroes, we don't know how far we can go. And we saw that as part of our job. And what a fun job it was to expand heroes in the public consciousness. A task done right not only sells shoes, but expands the game. It started with posters, sold in the US and a couple in Europe as well. George Gervin sitting on a on a throne of ice blocks. Nine NBA players in judges' robe, robes in front of the Supreme Court. Our Supreme Court, we said, and the Chief Justice was Moses Malone. And the Air Force One poster featuring Jamal, featuring Jamal Wilkes. And then came TV, Michael Jordan with Spike Lee, and then with Bugs Bunny. We made an opera singer out of Charles Barkley, who was not a role model. <clears throat> Mr. Robinson's Neighborhood, Penny Hardaway and his alter ego, a puppet named Little Penny. Kobe Bryant leaping a speeding Austin Martin, which drew eight million internet hits in the first hour after it ran on YouTube. Huge billboard campaigns in Beijing and Shanghai resulted in polls showing that the most popular celebrity in China was not Yao Ming or Liu Shang, it was Kobe Bryant. And Kobe Bryant, <clears throat> the process was started the process of becoming popular in China actually was started 20 years before with Michael Jordan. The most popular team in the early 1990s was the Chicago Red Oxen. And lately, LeBron and we are all witnesses. And a lot of people are looking forward to the LeBron ads to follow. And I can't tell you how much it means for me tonight to be surprised to see LeBron and Ken Griffey Jr. who's going into the Baseball Hall of Fame to come to this evening, and thank you. Mm. <laughs> Nike today is sold in 180 countries, and our biggest category is basketball. For a skinny kid from a small suburb of, suburb of Eastmoreland in the small city of Portland, Oregon, the ride has been a privilege, a privilege bordering on fantasy to associate not only with the game's greatest players, but its best coaches as well. The McGuire twins, Frank and Al, with Dean Smith and Dick Harder and Cotton Fitzsimmons and Jim Beheim and Roy Williams, Lute Olson, Jill Cal Jim Calhoun, and hundreds of others. 
and Jean Cady, who in June 2012 got married on a Nike coaches trip in Hawaii. His bride was given away walking down the aisle, Tubby Smith. <clears throat> it's been a particular pleasure to work with Jerry Colangelo and Mike Krzyzewski at the, on, with the last two Olympic teams. When we shot the 2008 Olympic basketball poster in front of the Statue of Liberty, virtually all 12 of the players were moved. And Carmelo Anthony summed up the feeling, standing in front of that Statue of Liberty for that poster, and he said, damn, we better win this thing. <laughs> it has been, all of it, a joy, which is capped by this evening. This evening, which in a single word is emotional, as in very. And that emotion will last for more than just one night. As I walk in twilight, I will be a little lighter, a little taller, a little prouder. I wanted to close with a tribute to that which binds us all in this room. But as I penciled the words down on paper, I found many of those words had a familiar ring. I was taken back more than a quarter century to a man who, although he was talking about a different game, said those words far better than what I was managing. So with a bit of paraphrasing, with a bit of paraphrasing, I will quote you with apologies to the late president of Yale University. Of course, there are those who learn after the first few times. They grow out of sports. And there are others who were born with the wisdom to know that nothing lasts. Those are the truly tough among us, the ones who can live without illusion or without even the hope of illusion. I am not that grown up or up to date. I am a simpler creature tied to more primitive patterns and cycles. I need to think that something lasts forever. And it might as well be that state of being that is a game. It might as well be that in a warm gym in a cold winter. Thank you.